Fortified Crops Program partners with us from Africa and Asia, from both the seed and the food sides, to share experiences and discuss challenges and opportunities in scaling up use of biofortified products. But first, we're gonna start off with some brief remarks from the leaders of the two CBC partner organizations. Uh, first, we'll have Arun Baral, who's the CEO of Harvest Plus, as well as a seasoned veteran of the global seed sector. And then Dr. Lauren Sadad, who's executive director of the Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition, or GAIN, uh, who is also a World Food Prize laureate and currently chairs Action Track One of the United Nations Food Systems Summit, focusing on ensuring safe and nutritious food for all. We'll then hear from the co-leads of the CBC program about the details of their work, followed by presentations, any panel discussion with our SME partners. So at this point, I'll turn the floor over to Arun. Thanks. Thank you, Peter, <clears throat> and good, uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, thanks for inviting, um, and thanks uh, to our partners, uh, GAIN, and uh, you know, uh, our colleagues at Harvest Plus in organizing this very important session on the role of SMEs in building strong um, businesses. So, um, you know, I just want to sort of start off with... Um, uh, talking about uh, biofortified crops, what they do, and how they can help SMEs um, really transform the food systems. So people must be asking, you know, what are these? What is biofortified crops? So you know, in, in the introduction, Peter mentioned uh, the um, nutrition, high in nutrition, naturally, you know, nutritious. And here are the crops that you see on your uh, screens. We have um, crops like pearl millet and beans that are high in iron. Uh, you have wheat and rice uh, that are high in um, zinc. And then you've got vitamin A options in maize, sweet potato, um, and cassava. Now, these crops are available in Africa, Asia. They are non-GM, so no controversy around them. Um, they are perfect for SMEs to adopt in terms of, uh, you know, if you're looking to innovate your product portfolios or renovate your pro product portfolios. Um, <clears throat> and then they have fit right well into the trends that we're talking about these days. You know, what are the consumers asking for? They're asking for natural, nutritious, clean label products. So... Um, just a, a quick sort of, you know, um, overview of, you know, what these crops are, what they can do for SMEs. And then, you know, from an SME perspective, I think if I were an entrepreneur, I would say you have all those folks who want to jump into this, you know, a biofortified uh, nutritious crop revolution. This is a great opportunity to make, make food systems more nutritious, provide healthy, you know, healthy options uh, to consumers. And this is where GAIN and Harvest Plus are working hard to really make those um, you know, options available. So now let's go to the chart where we have um, these crops available. Um, if you go back one more chart, this is a quick uh, sort of you know, a snapshot of where these crops are available. Dark blue tells you where they're available or in testing. So as you can see, big parts of Asia, Africa, and Latin America, these crops are, you know, um, available for uptake for all the SMEs to get involved in and, and then help really sort of bring healthy, nutritious options to the people. If we go to the next chart um, quickly then, you know, all the work that we have done in the last 15 years, Harvest Plus started the concept of can crops be bred to improve health? Can they, you know, be bred with high nutrition uh, that really then addresses malnutrition and this is where the malnutrition, you know, causes severe health problems. Um, and, and we have, you know, spent um, 15, 16 years doing it. Uh, the innovation is now ready. And that's why we partnered with GAIN, because GAIN brings us a strong access to SMEs uh, so that we can commercialize these crops. And we have all the evidence, et cetera, that these crops can provide anywhere between 25 to 100% of, you know, your daily vitamin and mineral intakes. So crops that are uh, rich in vitamin A, for example, can improve night vision, reduce, um, you know, 
vitamin A deficiency. Similarly, iron can improve uh, anemia, uh, improve um, you know, cognition, ability to think and work. And similarly, you know, zinc crops right now with COVID and everything can help your immunity um, and, and you know, ability to fight a lot of infections like uh, you know, pneumonia, et cetera, fever, et cetera. So very healthy options. And this is where the consumers are asking for, give us healthy options, give us natural options. And this is the time for SMEs uh, to sort of really take this innovation, hopefully, um, y- you know, help um, improve the food systems and, and the lives of millions of people. So if you go to the next chart, then uh, a little bit about our approach, you know, we take a value chain approach, obviously, you know, from research and development to the farm gate, um, then, you know, aggregate uh, th- those, uh, those, you know, grains from these healthy crops and then bring it to the dinner plates of the consumers. So the goal here is to raise, you know, our Harvest Plus works exclusively from our side on, uh, you know, raising awareness, demand creation, uh, building capacity, um, and then, you know, supporting the value chain actors and SMEs all the way through the value chain to make sure that you are successful and, and create an enabling environment through, you know, policy reforms, et cetera. So we do our part. We're here to help you is the message here. And, and, and if you want to get involved in this, this can be a very profitable business, which is, again, you know, healthy and, and, and improving, you know, ability to improve lives of millions of people. If we go to the next chart, then quickly... Um, so what I'm saying is all backed by not just the evidence and hard work that, uh, you know, has happened in the last 15 years, but, it'll pro- but the proof of the pudding is in the eating. And I went to Nigeria uh, before, the, before the pandemic hit, and I was surprised um, how many, you know, young entrepreneurs have come up using biofortified crops. So here are the pictures of some of the products, you know, th- they have been um, uh, sort of developed For example, uh, you know, um, (coughs) mixa grain that you see here, um, a young mother fed biofortified crops to her her second child and saw the difference between the first child and the second child that she became an entrepreneur. And now she has a thriving business and really helping, you know, improve lives of millions of people in Nigeria. Similarly, you know, there are other uh, um, (coughs) options with um, with cassava, so you know you have food products from cassava, which are high in vitamin A naturally and are very nutritious. And then likewise, you have um, you know the maize, uh, uh, the orange maize, or they call the yellow maize in uh, in, uh, in Nigeria, where the meals are being prepared. And and a lot of SMEs are now um, getting getting involved um, in, in in increasing the uptake of these crops. So I, what I sort of wanted to leave you with, with here was this is a unique opportunity for SMEs to, to, to really, you know, improve the food systems. This is a unique opportunity for SMEs uh, to have high innovation and renovation of their products. This is a unique opportunity from a profitability standpoint. And this is a unique opportunity that two large, largest, I would say, you know, leaders in the development world uh, gain and harvest plus are right behind you to support you um, and and increase the uptake of these crops. So if we can work with you, all the SMEs partner with you, uh, Lawrence and I would really sort of you know encourage people to get involved and 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 anything we can do to help, please reach out because our goal is to really uh, in the end uh, provide most nutritious food to the people. And these are the consumer trends, like I said before, and, you know, really help improve lives by addressing malnutrition um, or hidden hunger. So I'll stop here um, and pass it back to Peter. Thank you very much, Arun. And I think uh, that really underlines the fact that um, biofortification as a nutrition solution goes well beyond the nutrition itself. It's really... um, you know, it's a livelihood and it's an economic uh, approach to uh, addressing uh, malnutrition in a sustainable manner that also creates uh, economic and employment opportunities throughout the value chain for a variety of different actors. Um, 
So why don't we turn now to, to Lawrence, who I think is gonna give us a little more of the big picture about how biofortification fits into addressing malnutrition globally. Please go ahead, Lawrence. Thanks, you, you need to, okay, great. Let me just share my screen. Sure. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Aaron, and thank you, Gillian. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, um, what, where does, where does biofortification fit in? How do we fulfill the potential for biofortification to help end malnutrition? So just to give you a sense of the problem, one in three people worldwide are malnourished. And whenever I present that stats, that statistic to people, they're surprised. And it's they, they usually have a, a part of the picture, but not all of the pictures. They might be thinking about the 768 million people who are chronically hungry. They go to bed hungry every night and they wake up hungry every night and they do it over and over again until something changes. Either they die or they get access to food. There is 2 billion people that are deficient in vitamins or minerals, the so-called hidden hungry. Um, these are people who have enough food to fill their belly, um, most of them, but they're missing in key micronutrients, the kinds that Arun was talking about, zinc and iron and vitamin A, vitamin D. Uh, these are and vitamin C. These are really important components of the diet to promote the immune system, promote growth and prevent uh, disease. In addition to that, for the under fives, you have these kind of conditions, kids that are wasted, 47 million, uh, the too thin, their skin and bone. You have the stunted kids who are, they look okay, but really uh, you might think a seven-year-old is really four years old because they're so short. Uh, and, that, and that shortness means that their brains have been stunted as well as their bodies and their immune systems have been stunted and their life chances have been stunted. Um, and so th these are really serious consequences. But in addition, we have overweight or obesity of another 1.9 billion. And many of those people that are overweight or obese are also deficient in micronutrients, as you can see between the overlap between the yellow and the blue. So overall, one in three people worldwide are malnourished. And what's at the center of all those forms of malnutrition? Poor quality diets. It's not that diet is the only thing that's important for nutrition. Of course not. Water quality, health quality, sanitation quality, caring behaviors, they're all very important physical exercise. But the common denominator for all of these forms of malnutrition is poor quality diets. So biofortified crops is not just an issue for um, very low income settings. It's, a, it's a, a boon for low, middle and high income settings. Now, we, we in the audience, we think we have, in this audience, we think we have a lot of businesses and a lot of SMEs and a lot of uh, producers and and why do businesses have to be a big part of the solution to malnutrition that's because food systems are everything from production all the way through to consumption in terms of food quality and food safety you've got the food supply chains on the on the right the food environments on the left and businesses are everywhere right they're everywhere from the farmers the fisher folk through the transporters, the processors, the wholesalers, the finance companies, the infrastructure companies, the private employers, the traders, the speculators, the media, the market, refrigeration, preservatives, testing equipment. There, businesses like yours are everywhere. And in, in most settings in Africa and South Asia and Southeast Asia, it's the smaller medium enterprises that are really the backbone of the system. So if you're a small or medium enterprise or a smallholder producer, smallholder farmer, why should you grow, buy, process, sell, fortified, biofortified crops? Well, the first thing is, as I think Arun and Peter stressed, this is, this, is good for your, this is good for your income and your livelihoods. These kinds of crops, the demand for them is growing. They tend to be higher value crops. Um, they are, it's called harvest plus for a reason. The plus means that you, there's no there's no loss on yield side, but there's a plus when it comes to the nutrition side. So there's no sacrifice when it comes to biofortified crops um, on the yield side. In fact, there's a positive on the yield side. What's good for human health is good for plant health. So that's very important. The second part is it boosts nutrition and health. And this is important. Consumers are getting more and more 
interested in health and food as a component of health. Young people especially are becoming very aware of the importance of you, know, you are what you eat. But also adaptation to climate change is very important. So many young people are concerned about the impacts of climate change and the, the, the need to prevent climate change. And we know that high levels of CO2 depress the nutrient density in staple foods. So here's a ready-made adaptation to climate change. And finally, here's a way of promoting resilience. In the post-COVID, or we're still, we're not post-COVID, we're in the middle of the COVID period. What's happened to food systems is, is that perishable foods have become more uh, susceptible to disruptions in food supply and the food chain and the food value chain because of lockdowns and uh, restrictions around movement. That means perishable foods have become more prone to being um, not moved to the right place and therefore um, being lost, being spoiled, becoming unsafe. And the staple foods tend to be um, more, more um, less prone to the kinds of disruptions that COVID-19 brings. And biofortified crops, because they are done from within staple foods, can promote resilience within the food system, at least when it comes to access to nutrients. So what support do you need to succeed? Well, you need demand from consumers. If consumers are not interested in these foods, then this is going nowhere. This is a, this is a push strategy, but you need a pull strategy as well. And that's where, again, and uh, Harvest Plus and other partners can really help uh, learn from other SMEs, learn from the other work we do, and help build the demand from consumers for these crops. Often we have to link the demand for healthy foods to things that consumers really care about. Consumers often, not always, but often don't care that much about nutrition, but they do care about taste, about convenience, about way, the way things feel in the mouth, the way they, the, the way, the way they cook, the, the versatility of foods. If we can find a way to linking health to the thing they really care about, then we're in business. Um, the public sector also needs to demand these foods. The World Food Program, um, governments are, are, are major purchases of food for, for their social protection programs, for their schools. We need to build the demand from the public sector for these kinds of foods. Sends a very strong signal to the business sector as well as to consumers. We need the right public standards. Um, the public standards have to be there. They have to be easy to manage, easy to comply with, and understandable and transparent. And then business development needs to be there. How do you build a business around this potential demand for consumers for this potential uh, product, this biofortified product? How do you get the seeds you need on time? How do you get the other inputs? How do you get the finance for it? And again, GAIN and Harvest Plus and our partnership, along with all the other partners, uh, we can really help. Um, build these four dimensions out. So the partnership was launched in 2019. It's GAIN and Harvest Plus, and we have uh, support from the German and, and the Netherlands government. And we're, we're really ambitious. Our desired impact is we want hundreds of millions of people consuming biofortified crops and food products by 2022 and 2028. We're ambitious because the, the scale of the problem demands it. And we have an opportunity with the Food System Summit this year and Nutrition for Growth. And COVID-19 generates lots of challenges, but it also generates lots of opportunities. Thank you very much. Back to you, Peter. Thank you very much, Lawrence. And Arun and Lawrence, I think uh, together you definitely made the case for why biofortification could be an essential element of addressing malnutrition and all the opportunities that it, uh, that it presents, uh, both to smallholder farmers and to, to people and organizations and entrepreneurs throughout seed and crop and food value chains. Um, but getting to the, to the brass tax level, uh, how, how do we do this? And I think this is where our co-leads of the CBC program will really be able to enlighten us uh, about how we're doing it on the ground. Um, our first uh, speaker is Ravinder Grover, who is the co-lead from Harvest Plus. Um, he has a master's in agribusiness from the National Institute of Agriculture Extension Management in India. 
And um, he has led many large engagements with public, private, and development sector in the area of supply chain optimization, route to market, policy advocacy, and business transformation. I'll pass it over to Ravinder, who will be followed by uh, Ishank Gorla, who is the co-lead from GAIN for the CBC program, who holds an MBA from, in communications and advertising from Symbiosis and International University in India. And uh, I will leave it to you, Ravinder and Ishak, now. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you, Peter. It's so encouraging to see so many people showing interest in uh, the subject of biofortification. Uh, I would like to start with this question. Uh, did you have your dinner last night? I'm sure the answer to this is yes. Did it sate your hunger? And probably the answer to this question is also yes. Now, did it give you the desired amount of nutrition? Now, this is a difficult question and that's a question that we will be trying to answer today. Uh, I will be taking you through uh, the details of the program and then I'll hand it over to my colleague Ishank for discussing challenges and how SMEs can play a role in shaping up this program further. Ishank, we can go next. Like Lawrence mentioned, you know, this is the largest segment of uh, hidden hunger which we are trying to tackle. There are not nearly 2 billion people, and that's those primarily exist in low and middle income countries who do not get essential vitamins and minerals, which is leading to blindness, stunting, poor brain development, weakened immunity, anemia. Now, luckily, movie, uh, Nishan, next slide, please. Now, this is a real problem, and it's not only a health issue. If you combine it with the fact that countries incur huge losses in handling the problem of uh, malnutrition, for example, India spends around 12 billion uh, for handling hidden hunger. I mean, so these losses amount to around 1.5 billion for Nigeria, 3 billion for Pakistan. So, hidden hunger is a real problem. Fortunately, there are solutions uh, to tackle this problem which exist. The solutions can start from a dietary diversification, which can happen at a consumer level itself, then all the way to in the factories where industrial fortification of food is possible and which is being tried for uh, edible oil and other products. Then it can, the solutions also exist at pharmacy level and these have now gained popularity in the COVID times where uh, vitamin and mineral supplements are available for the consumers to take. Now there's one more wonderful solution that's available. And that's going one step further and doing something at the crop level. And this is called biofortification. In biofortification, what we are doing is essentially, to put it in very simple terms, we are working on the crops, enhancing their natural micronutrient and vitamin levels so that they become more nutritious to the consumers. Now, there are many benefits that come with this strategy. A, they are targeted primarily to the rural poor, um, mainly being cultivated by farmers, which are the target groups for us. Uh, more importantly, biofortification is sustainable because the investments are generally upfront and we don't need to keep on incurring costs uh, to sustain these practices. And also the biofortification, most of the biofortification varieties are climate resilient, so they are more future ready. And our the one more important particular is that it reaches to the vulnerable segment. So most of the women and the children, so farmer consume, when they consume it at their home, the most of the women and the children who are more susceptible to malnutrition problems, they are being catered through this approach. Biofortification essentially works as a complementary strategy to all the other three strategies that we discussed. It's a good strategy, but it's not a new strategy. The idea of biofortification dates back to say 15 years back when uh, our founder, Dr. Howard Boyce asked this question, can we make crops to work for our health? And that's where the biofortification journey started. Today, Harvest Plus leads the global effort on developing, testing and creating varieties for biofortification. And we found a perfect partner in GAIN, which is working on uh, creating structural changes to the food system, uh, which deliver better and nutritious and safe food to the populations. So this was a natural partnership that existed and led to the launch of uh, 
commercialization of biofortified crops program in 2019. The program essentially builds on strengths of Harvest Plus and GAIN, Harvest Plus being primarily contributing to the supply chain side of activities and GAIN contributing to the demand side of activities. The overall vision of the program is to scale up commercialization of biofortified foods and with an objective of reaching 190 million consumers by 2022. The program works on three key goals improving access to inputs and markets for biofortified seeds and foods, then strengthening demand for these nutrient-rich staple groups, and which is a very important goal, like Lawrence mentioned, that demand could be from the, at the consumer level as well as the public sector level. And the last goal is to work on the enabling environment, which includes policy advocacy and standards piece. So these are the three goals that program primarily works on. Next, please. Currently, the program works cuts across six countries, three countries in Asia, Pakistan, India, and Bangladesh. In Africa, we are focusing on Nigeria, Kenya, and Tanzania. Three nutrients, iron, zinc, and vitamin A, six crops, pearl millet, beans, wheat, rice, cassava, and maize, and which gives us nine value chains to work with. So it's, uh, the program is well spread across geographies, crops, and nutrients. As far as the program approach is concerned, of course, the farmer remains at the center of the program delivery, both as a consumer as well as a producer of uh, biofortified crops. But primarily, program takes the value chain development approach. And what does it mean? It means we are not reinventing the wheel. We are working with existing partners across the value chain and helping to build their capacity so that they can deliver better value to the consumers and the farmers. In addition to you know, working on the businesses, for demand creation and marketing of biofortified seeds, grains, and food programs. Next. Now, how does this program help taking biofortified food from the farmer to the consumer? And there are various routes to market, which we call as impact pathways. Uh, to simplify it for you, there are four possible options. Once a biofortified grain is grown by the farmer, it can either be consumed by the farmer at his household level, or it can be gifted by him to friends and family. And in certain countries, this is a very important practice. It can as well reach to the consumer through an institutional pathway, wherein school feeding programs, public distribution systems, they play an important part. And lastly, it can as well be purchased by consumers in a formal setting. So now, depending on the country, maturity of the value chain, there are uh, you know, various pathways are prioritized. For example, if you take example of Tanzania, probably the school feeding programs, which is an institutional pathway, is the priority pathway for the program. When you go to India, look at iron pearl millet, then uh, the formal purchase by consumer is the pathway which is being focused upon. Now, irrespective of the choice of the pathway, being an agriculture commodity and a value chain, there are challenges. And the value chain interventions are not easy. Now to discuss those challenges and then how the program is trying to tackle those challenges, I'll invite my colleague Ishan to take you through that section. Over to you, Ishan. Thank you, Ravinder, and thanks everyone uh, for giving, giving me the opportunity. So uh, Ravinder very rightly uh, spoke about the commercialization pathway. And if I can generalize and rather simplify it for everybody, this is what the agricultural value chain really looks like. It's an oversimplification, I understand, but there are a lot of, uh, you know, crisscross elements. But if, if you see from agricultural research to retailing, uh, this is generally what usually uh, happens in most of the countries. And as far as the program is concerned, we start off from the agricultural supply and go till the retailing level. So all uh, from number three to number eight is what the core focus of the program lies. And, a and as we are working uh, across this value chain, especially in these five to six touch points, there are certain challenges that we are facing. Specifically, I think uh, Lawrence and Ravinder mentioned about this, but the first and foremost is the demand. By demand, I also mean that the awareness uh, of uh, biofortification, whether that be seed, crop, or foods, is pretty low uh, in, in the market and also amongst the stakeholders. And, and even if th there are certain elements or rather some businesses who know about biofortification, they are playing at such a price which is not really sustainable uh, and really cannot be uh, you know, used for a long-term impact. Uh, 
The other is differentiation. So uh, it's, it has it has been long debated that whether the biofortified food should be, uh, sh you know, uh, visually should be same, or rather similar or different to the analog varieties. And it has been chosen that probably it is in the best interest of everyone to have them uh, look like the analog varieties. And therefore, the challenge comes of appearance. So even though it tastes, uh, the biofortified foods taste exactly the same but in some cases even better than the analog varieties you really cannot differentiate between the two uh, between the analog as well as uh, biofortified and ultimately when it goes to the market it becomes even more complex to really track and trace and which brings me to the traceability and aggregation uh, perspective on things so there, there is a lack of standards in terms of the grain also in terms uh, in terms of how uh, the food products are positioned in the market especially uh, when they leave the farm gate, there is a challenge on how do we identify and how do you standardize things across the value chain. There's also an element of sporadicity by which I mean is that the farmers are growing these biofortified crops uh, in their respective geographies and there's no uh, tangible way that we are seeing in which we can you know, accumulate all the produce and help uh, help, uh, which can help in the aggregation uh, a little better. We are working around these challenges, but this remains a major, major hurdle that we have to tackle as we speak. And the other is the adulteration in, in, in perspective of uh, how the agricultural practices are usually uh, followed in most of the countries, there is a big issue around adulteration and mixing as well. And last but not the least, the private and public partnerships. So in terms of, in, as I said about standards, there is uh, an inherent lack uh, when it comes to the policy documentation around biofortified foods, and, and which also stems from the lack of awareness. And ultimately, because of these two, uh, when we talk with the food companies, there is a challenge around product development as well, because a lot of the companies that need handhold, uh, hand holding and support regarding what are the nutritious foods that could be developed from biofortified grains, uh, so as to say. And I think coming on to the question that you all, uh, you would be looking forward to and need answer for is that wh why small and medium enterprises? Why are we even talking to you in this first webinar? So I don't really want to get into the details about what a SME is, because the definition varies based, based upon the headcount and turnover and balance. But I just want to emphasize that SMEs play a major role in global economic development, whether that be in terms of uh, the jobs that uh, the SMEs create and also in terms of uh, the contribution to the national income or GDP. And more specifically, because we are talking about uh, you know, development organizations, uh, the sustainable development goals and the role that SMEs play in really achieving this is, is immense. I mean, I can, I can directly say that SDGs can only be achieved if the countries manage to build up strong SMEs. And especially goal eight and goal nine, which are directly economic S SDGs, it is something that uh, is related to the more and more presence of SMEs, but it also has an indirect impact on goal uh, two and three, etc. What are the SME attributes? Uh, so I think, you know, I, enough of generalization. I, since most of the people in this room are from SMEs, so I want to talk to you directly. I think uh, it is, uh, it is a stated fact that SMEs, or rather you, are the, key, are the key drivers of innovation. It was concluded by the famous economist William Baumol, who said that, that most of the breakthrough innovations in recent dec decades have come from new and small firms, because contrary to large enterprises, you can work outside dominant paradigms and without strong ties to existing products and technologies. And because of your size, you are much better at identifying and em embracing new trends in the market. Inherently, most of you are solely focused on creating new products or services because that is how you differentiate yourself in the market. And it may seem very obvious, but your proximity to the customers or consumers in most of the cases is your trump card. You know the consumers better. You know the consumers directly. You deal with them directly and you understand their needs more accurately than even the large organizations in the market. And even though it, it seems like an oxymoron because of the finance challenge that I'm almost about to speak about, but you inherently have a larger risk appetite because you're more creative. You take the things head on because of your proximity to the consumers. And why do we feel, why do all of us feel that SMEs and CBC, which is uh, the program named commercialization of biofortified crops, why do we feel it is the right fit? Uh, 
So talking about the challenges that an SMEs or rather you really face uh, if you are in food and agri sector is the limitation to scale up operations, limitation to have a larger employee base. Uh, there is a constant and but, uh, you know, there's a constant uh, fear of a very limited reach when you have an excellent product differentiated in the market. So you want to reach uh, more consumers and improve your advertising exposure. And last but not the least, the access to finance, which really limits not only your R&D budgets, but also limits your creativity is something as a, is, which is a major challenge, is a challenge you face. And what are the program opportunities? What are we offering? The first and foremost, I think you've, you would have realized by now that biofortified crops are inherently different than the other ones, nutritionally and otherwise. So there is a USP embedded in the product itself. There is no need to really uh, position the product when you already have an offering. We, we give you the technical support, the marketing and exposure uh, to really reach a uh, beyond your confined geographies. We give you an assured supply and also, but most importantly, the financial support. As far as the employees are concerned, uh, the program has uh, elements of capacity building and skill development. And we also, as we grow together, uh, your business grow, our agenda remains malnutrition, eradicating malnutrition, but we do understand that you are SMEs, you are the private sector, and you probably have a profitability as on top of your mind. And finally, we are here to collaborate. We are here to co-learn and we want you to be our biggest critics. We want you to, and then eventually be our biggest advocate. We have taken some design, de design decisions that you saw in the previous slides and we want you to validate it. And based upon how you mutually advocate with us about our connections and about the processes we follow, I think moving forward, it is, I think we, we really want to contribute and succeed together in the whole business. And there are, there are certain examples of Dehat and Agriscope. Uh, you know, these are the organizations that we have coll collaborated with, but I would let them speak for themselves as they proceed our presentation uh, for now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ishank and Ravinder. I think you've uh, described very well why it's important to engage with SMEs and the many different ways that the CBC program can assist and empower and, and strengthen and capacity for them in all the different areas of the, uh, of the value chain. And as you mentioned, at this point, we're really gonna get to the brass tacks. We're gonna start hearing from the partners themselves. You mentioned already, we're gonna be hearing from Agriscope and Dahat. Um, First, we're going to hear from Rogers Mugambi, the commercial lead at Agriscope Kenya. Um, he's going to be talking about profiting from nutrient enriched crops, sort of the journey through the market for these nutrient enriched crops. Uh, just so you know, East African Seed Company, um, they, he helped lead them to get the number one ranking in access to seeds index in Eastern and Southern Africa. That's an index with measures and compares the efforts of the world's leading seed companies to enhance the productivity of smallholder farmers. So very, very impressive uh, achievement. Uh, Rogers also has more than 20 years experience in seed and other agro inputs industries. Uh, Rogers, please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much and uh, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. I'm very happy to join this uh, very important conversation. <laughs> and our story in Kenya is not different from the other parts of the world. Um, and I would start by uh, just confirming that by way of saying, uh, as you can see from my slide, back, um, out of the 7 million under five year old children in our country, nearly 2 million of them uh, suffer from uh, chronic malnutrition, and that uh, report from USA in 2018 can tell the story of what everyone is going through, either silently or sometimes even in knowledge. And out of that, we can see the statistics are wasting 4%, starting, uh, stunting 26%, and underweight um, 11%. So these indicators, um, however, show that malnutrition is gradually improving for, for our case. From 35% in 2008, uh, we are now at uh, in 2014 at 26%. And in, in view of this situation, therefore, 
um, these high nutrient enriched crops, and more particularly in our case, the one we are dealing with uh, at the moment, high iron beam and high on zinc, is we think, in our opinion, is a near perfect uh, solution which can bridge this kind of gap. And the beauty of the beans is that it forms, you know, a part of almost every meal that we do in our in our Kenyan situation and, and maybe uh, much of our African continents. Next slide. And uh, this is how we started our journey of these crops. Uh, the our story is interesting. I was on a field trip in Kenya and I landed on um, on this mineral enriched beans uh, in Machakos. That was late in 2017, and that's when we accessed um, the first uh, few kilos of uh, the two varieties. Uh, one um, Angaza and the other one is Faida. Be and knowing the, the value of these crops from a nutrition point of view, and like one of the speakers has already mentioned, uh, that forms a very big differentiator in presenting it to the farmers, and therefore not, not much effort uh, may be required in convincing uh, the farmers to, to take it up. And uh, the license agreement for the same was done in 2018 with CARRO, which is our public research institution. Uh, and we started our scale up pro uh, programs for seed production uh, in 2018 and 2019, uh, and a bit of uh, sales also last year. Um, and then we have now continued with the bulking uh, uh, projects for seed production to make this very important uh, seed available to as many farmers as possible. Maybe to just mention is that we had teething problems uh, initially because we started with a very small amount of uh, breeder seed and thereafter also, and there was a lot of demand on the part of farmers, but with the help and support of uh, Harvest Plus uh, this year, uh, we have uh, upscaled and accelerated these programs uh, from uh, seed production uh, to marketing and promotion, as we will see in the next slides. Next slide, please. So we marked out um, five counties within the county, the country and set up some demonstration plots, uh, various items that will help create demand. And that was bullet number one on most of the, of the pre uh, previous uh, presenters that the need to create more demand and uh, create awareness on the part of uh, the consumers and the part of the farmers and even the network through which we make this seed available to farmers. And also, so we set out to, uh, five counties, Nakuru, Transoya, Bomet, Makwene, and Machakos, where we have uh, uh, planned to do 20 demos in each of those uh, counties. And then from uh, demos, next slide, we have uh, in the same counties planned to do field days uh, in, in 20 locations. Um, basically, this will help us now and hopefully the COVID situation will have improved to assemble as many farmers as possible in one location, in each of the locations in order to, to create awareness on the part of the farmers. One is on the bean as a food item, but more importantly, as a nutritional uh, complement in their, in their diets. Next, uh, then we thought, for this process to be continuous and so that we have on a daily basis someone uh, visiting farmers and talking to farmers about this uh, mineral rich crops, uh, the beans that we have, we engaged um, field promoters, one in each, each county, and that one motorized uh, promoter to take care of the 20 demos and mobilize the farmers around it uh, work with the crop so that as we get to, to, to the field day when the crop is 
uh, the right stage of, of uh, teaching the farmers, then they, um, a majority of the farmers within those locations would have known uh, about the products. Next, please. Then a very important item or on, on, the, or on the ability to, for the farmers to, to access the seeds. And this, um, the company as we have about 300 agro dealers in the country in Kenya. And out of those, we have another, uh, the network is very extensive and it's almost 12,000 in number in the country, which ensures that if we supply seed, the farmers are able to get it from the, the as easy as possible, uh, meaning that they do not need to, to go very far to access the seeds. So in order to sensitize those that link us between, uh, those that are um, the, the bridge between ourselves and the millions of farmers, these stockists, we have selected 10 locations again from where we do uh, stockist trainings. And this is an assembly of a number of stockists in each of the locations to talk about these very important uh, crops. Next, please. Again, as uh, to talk to those that we cannot reach, we will, uh, we plan to engage uh, media, media, to do some media campaigns and advertisements. And this is uh, through these FM stations, the FS, FM stations that address farmers in their own uh, local languages and in their own locations. And that will uh, create a very effective message. And for reference, we also plan to, to do uh, leaflets and brochures, which farmers can now refer uh, in case someone has missed something, and even posters uh, across the agro dealer network in order for the farmers to, to see as they go into buying other inputs. Next, next slide. So this is how we've planned our production plans. As you can see, Already we've done eight metric ton in the first season of, uh, of uh, we did eight metric ton in uh, 2020. And um, in 2021, we plan to achieve 420 metric ton. I was trying to calculate this uh, in, in, in kilos, how much, if we give this seed out to farmers, how much we are likely to achieve and I'm looking and it was coming to 10 million kilos. So from 420,000 kilos uh, sent out to, to, to farmers, we'll be able to release, to be, we'll be able to get grain of uh, uh, 10, million, um, 10 million kilos of, of grain, which will be a, a, very, big, um, a very big jump. And uh, in the subsequent year, in the following year, which is 2022, we even plan for, for for much bigger volumes, but my statement of summary on that uh, production plan is that if we can sustain these stronger partnerships like we have uh, with Harvest Plus, uh, with GAIN and the other partners, uh, and if we see the programs that are there for to sensitize farmers and even those others involved in the value chain, those that are aggregating, those that are taking, those that are value, uh, adding value, um, like Miller's, I mean, this is going to be a very successful program. Next slide, please. Next slide. Yeah, so this is more about the features of the two products. Um, there is distinct, as you can see, Angaza, Angaza is, uh, is uh, more like uh, sugar color, uh, like brown sugar color and uh, FIDA, which is next, is red mottled, much more red mottled. And those are the two options we are giving. Next slide. Here we show, the next slide. Here we show a uh, training of, uh, one slide back, yeah, here. We show training on uh, seed bean production to farmers. And in the next slide, is the is a seed production uh, site at Gesha Farm in Taveta, and this crop we are expecting it uh, around the tenth of September in a matter of about three weeks' time. 
Now, what do we see next? What do we see as the summary benefits relating to these new uh, nutrient and rich crops? In particular, for our case, we see that the bean is a major source of food and a perfect complement in our meals. And that is a fact, uh, knowing that, <clears throat> uh, you know, because of health issues, we are running away from uh, meat, particularly red meat, and bean is a natural pro uh, product um, uh, which complements that. Then we see also these nutritional benefits, key among them, of course, high iron, B, high, high iron and high zinc. And our earlier speakers already highlighted the importance of iron and the importance of zinc, among other benefits. Then there is very good uh, trend opportunities among the smallholder farmers and consumers for improved incomes. If you see right now, I can tell you, uh, we have about uh, five different WhatsApp groups for farmers doing these high iron beans. And the kind of um, discussion in those, in those groups is, is very good, where a farmer has his beans, but if you look at how much the price is going up, you even get encouraged and say, how can you get as much seed to, to as many farmers as possible? Again, this bean is an excellent rotational crop for nitrogen fixation in our cells, and we know that. Um, and the same, we can see opportunities in seed production. And one of the biggest employers uh, in our agro sector you, uh, is seed production because of uh, a multiple of things that have to be done to these crops. Uh, it creates very good opportunities even for jobs and uh, of course uh, in the entire value chain. And then uh, last but not least, there exists a ready market for nutrients and uh, enriched crops for food and nutrition and for, for processing. This is a very, very important factor even for seed companies like ourselves, uh, because we see um, sometimes you struggle with a product and you want the product to quickly gain ground, but this one, we are now struggling to meet demand, which is already out there. The seed that you have seen there, we, um, that one site is almost 200 metric ton of seed being coming from there, but I can tell you it's already bought. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Rogers, for that very informative uh, presentation and all the uh, opportunity that there seems to be in, in Kenya to, uh, to scale up biofortification. I just wanted to ask you a quick question and kind of relates to uh, what Ishank was talking about in terms of challenges uh, as well as opportunities. Um, you know, we often talk about the enabling environment. Um, you know, what needs to happen at the broader level to really scale up biofortification and, uh, and, and its use and production. I'm wondering in, in, your, in your case, in terms of Kenya, do you see anything that, uh, that the government or other partners need to be doing to really, to really help scale things up? Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> I think, yeah, very good question. And uh, I can answer it in two ways. Number one, uh, we need uh, seed companies like ourselves who need access to, to breeder seed, sufficient access to breeder seed, so that we are able to accelerate our seed production programs. Number two um, is that there can be a very quick gain, in my opinion, because of the nutritional nature of this product, uh, to get it to all the farmers if the governments, our governments, can just simply pass a regulation to say oh, those all those that are doing any milling for 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 flowers must put a certain percentage of mineral rich beans or mineral rich crops i can tell you if that happens then all of us will run into it investments will come directed to that that particular uh, site because the greater gain is to all of us, is to all the populations, the, 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 the citizens, not only the, the
the sin sellers, but the health part of the of the people, which is a primary, which is primary to all governments. Good. So that's very interesting. So you're kind of getting to the standards uh, question, and you know, asking for minimum levels, if you will, of those nutrients in products to really drive the production and, and drive the market. That's very interesting. And I think we'll be talking about that with some of the other uh, SME reps as well. Thanks, thanks again, Rogers. Um, thank now you. we're going, thank you. Now we're going to, to switch gears a little bit. Um, we're gonna be hearing from, sorry, I uh, just lost my screen. <laughs> sorry about that. Um, we're gonna be hearing from Abhinav Raghavanshi from who's an associate vice president with the Hot India. And he's gonna be talking about how to address commercializing challenges through digital solutions. And this gets to some of what Rogers was talking about in terms of best ways to really reach and inform and engage uh, farmers and others in biofortification. Um, just to note that Dahat has a, a digital network of about 500,000 farmers that they're currently uh, be able to reach out to. Um, and they're looking to substantially increase that um, in coming years. So we sh we're very interested to find out what, how, how that works and how that can help uh, scale up biofortification. Please go ahead, Abhinav. Thank you, Peter. Uh, hi, all. So as Peter mentioned, Dehat is one of the fastest growing startups here in India in the agri-tech space. And we currently work with about 500,000 farmers, providing them with end-to-end -end agri services, be it seeds, fertilizer, pesticides, or output marketing linkages. So our aim is to reach about 5 million farmers by 2024. Although we have worked with a lot of partners, but uh, this is the first time that we have been able to work with a partner who's offering us to chance, uh, chance to work in the biofortification space. So for that, I would like to thank Gain, and especially Ishan, to give us this opportunity. Now coming on to, next slide please, Peter. So coming on to commercialization. So when we hear the term commercialization, that should immediately translate to the word scale. So because without scale, there can be no commercializations. Uh, case in point would be the implementation of iodine in salt in India. So now if you look at any uh, publicly available salt, that is by default with iodine in it. You cannot find a sample of salt in the market that is without iodine content. So I guess that again had uh, spearheaded that moment here in India and that, now that has become the new normal. So by commercialization, when it comes to our mind, it should immediately translate to scale or this becoming the new normal. For this to happen, as has been pointed out by the previous presenters, the key stakeholders, be the seed producers, be the farmers, be the aggregators, or be the processors, all need to be on the same page as far as what is the end goal here. But key or the central pivot to all of them is the farmer, as pointed out by Dr. Ravinder in his presentation. Because farmer in the end is the deciding factor here. He needs to decide whether or not he'll be sowing that particular biofortified crop in his field or not. He is the one who decides whether or not he'll be selling it to the requisite aggregator or the directly to the processor, or will he be consuming at his home, or will he be sending it to some family members? So he is the key deciding factor here or the central pivot on which this whole commercialization project hinges. Next slide, please, Peter. Yeah. So when we talk about farmers or commercialization of this particular project of biofortification, what is the key challenges that I see that we need to solve? Number one would be the monetary benefits. The monetary benefits need to be clear to all major stakeholders, especially the farmers. For example, any, any given aggregator or processor has his own line of business, which is already working on. So he needs to have that monetary incentive in place to switch from his normal run of the mill projects to something of a biofortified nature. This holds true, especially for farmers here in India who are very marginal or small scale and their risk taking ability is very low. Only when the, with the right monetary incentives can we uh, persuade them or educate them to shift from normal agriculture to a biofortified based crop. The second would be the supply and demand linkages. So when we talk about biofortification, Two, need, two things need to be very 
clear and set in stone. One would be supplying these biofortified seeds to the farmers and the other would be supplying the produce or the harvest that the farmers produce to the necessary producers and finally to the uh, retail outlets where it can be consumed by a, by a larger majority of consumers. If either of these ends is not taken care of, it disrupts the whole value chain and as soon as the value chain is disrupted, it, it starts a kind of negative feedback or reverse feedback in which we lose our purpose of implementing it on a large scale. Third would be awareness. Uh, the whole purpose of our webinar today is creating more awareness about what biofortification is, how we can implement it, what are the challenges that we face and how SMEs can address this. So awareness is the key and especially with farmers. Reason being when you work in a rural setup versus a vis-a-vis -vis urban setup, awareness plays a major hurdle. For an urban setup, there are multiple avenues that you have which by which you can reach out to the customer and tell him, for example, someone pointed out in their slide that today's youth is very well aware what is the you know benefits of having uh, products with biofortification, with the right nutrients, with the right uh, set of micronutrients that can take care of his health. But what about the other end of the spectrum, the farmer's end? How aware is he of the benefits or challenges that he can face when shifting from a normal crop to a biofortified crop. So awareness is very important here. Fourth is speed of implementation. Now this is something that most of us forego or don't see or don't pay attention to. Now, if you look at the market of any crop, when any crop is introduced, the major challenge that you get is from your competitors. Farmer or anybody has a lot of options available at him, which he, which he can choose from. So. If your product works, you need to have the speed to achieve the required scale in a very short span of time. Otherwise, your competitor could bring in new products or new set of uh, monetary benefits by which he can replace that. So speed of implementation is very crucial for implementing such a product. How to solve? Now, moving on, how can we solve these four inherent challenges? Sorry, same slide. Yeah. So two key things that we need to take care of are traceability and aggregation. I guess these were covered by Ishank as well. So why traceability? When you pitch this idea of biofortification to any major stakeholder, be the producer, be the aggregator, be the processor, or be the farmer, the first question that they have is, what is the volume that you're offering to me? For example, if we go to a processor, I tell him that I'll be supplying biofortified harvest to you of iron pearl millet. He'll ask how much, what is the volume that you're supplying to me year on year? Give me an estimate so that I can, you know, necessarily scale up my production units or shift from my uh, normal chain to by, by fortified chain. So that traceability needs to be there. Second thing that Ishank also pointed out was, you know, spurious products, mixing of products. So if from the farmer end, we are not able to trace the product right to the processor, right to the retailer, there is an inherent chance of it being uh, mixed with other low quality of or non biofortified products, which inherently leads to negative feedback and the processor might give up the whole process. The second would be aggregation. Now aggregation is key why? because whenever you're starting a project, the scale you start from is very small and you build up from there. Now, if you, you talk about 100 or 200 or 300 farmers to start from, aggregating them and taking to the right producer is the key here. Otherwise, the, the, the value chain between the farmer and the processor breaks down. If you can't supply the processor with a limit, sufficient enough amount of harvest, he will never take up a project because he needs to set up a different value chain altogether for your biofortified crop. Now, moving on, as far as the farmer level effort is concerned, he needs to be informed duly about the availability of biofortified seed, where he, where he can get that particular seed, where he can sell that particular seed, the market linkages need to be made clear to the farmer, and what inherent monetary benefits he can derive. Maybe at a higher price, he can sell it vis-a-vis -vis normal, any normal pearl millet or zinc which he's selling. Compared to that, if he sends a biofortified uh, harvest, it can fetch him a higher price in the market. Second, as I mentioned, aggregation and traceability to the processor no, no, about... Just to let you know, you have about three minutes left. 
Sure. Uh, so aggregation and traceability. So to the processes, this needs, this needs to be made, made clear when and how much is the harvest coming and how much he can expect the produce from. Similarly, aggregation and demand to the producers from year on year. So for example, harvest plus, if they're producing a biofortified crop uh, for biofortified seeds for the next year, they need to have a clear understanding of how much to produce so that they can meet the existing demand or the future demand. As pointed out by my previous speaker, the challenge that they're facing in Kenya is a supply demand problem. They are getting huge demand and they are not able to meet that demand. Fourth, as, as I mentioned, is the speed of implementation. Now how Dehath is uh, working on this is, we have digitized the farm boundaries out of smallholder farmers and we have optimized their advisory. Through this, what we have able to achieve is right from the producer till the aggregator, we have been able to trace the entire value chain so that we can offer the same to every stakeholder, be it gain, be it HP, or be it the producer of when, where, and how the produce is coming to them. And we can extend this value chain in the coming years right to the retail outlet or the final consumer. Next slide, please. This is the uh, technology or the app that we are currently offering to our farmers to help digitize their farm plots and trace the harvest that they're trying to produce. Thank you, Peter. That's about it. From us. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Abhinav, I wonder if you could just elaborate a little bit on the on the app very quickly and in terms of its uh, ease of use and, and, and adaptability and, and, you know, two different different uh, uh, players and the actors in the in the value chain. Uh, sure. How exactly do they use it? Um, is it, uh, you know, for your average smallholder farmer in terms of adoption of technology? Um, what what might be the challenges there, uh, or is there not a challenge? <laughs> Can you just sure. elaborate a little bit? Thank you. Sure. So, like you rightly said, so this app is uh, let me mention it here. This app is particularly for the farmers and not for the all the stakeholders in the value chain. First of all, secondly, like you said, inherently in India, you get three sets of farmers. One is the lead farmers who are very well versed with these kind of technologies are and readily adopted. The second set of farmers are okay with using these, but they need some incentive. And the third set of farmers who are very marginal and are not very tech savvy and cannot use such kind of technologies. So what we target with this particular app is the first two set of farmers. With the right incentives, this app is very easy to use for any farmer. What he can do is he can track where to buy the inputs from, at what prices he, want, he can buy the inputs from. He can plot his farm on the app and he can track how his particular crop is performing. So he gets every, every every few days, he gets a feedback from the app. This is this is the next set of activities that you need to perform on your particular crop and for, for you to get the highest amount of produce. Completing the value chain at the end of the harvest cycle, he also gets another input of where he can sell at the highest produce, highest rates, where he can get the highest rates for his particular produce. That is how we address these challenges, Peter. Very good. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. And, and in fact, it is something that uh, not only in in your country but in many other countries, we are looking into ways to uh, to leverage these kinds of, particularly mobile technologies, to really make it easier to both trace and 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 facilitate communication throughout the entire value chain as, as well. So. Uh, it's a very exciting, um, very exciting project, and we look forward to seeing uh, more progress there. So thank you again. Um, so now we are going to shift to our panel discussion. Um, and uh, Jillian, I don't know if we are going to be showing all the panelists at once or not. But uh, what I was thinking of doing is instead of introducing everybody uh, at once, I'm going to introduce them one by one as we go along. Um, we have five panelists, uh, three who are in the more on the food side of the spectrum and two that are more on the seed side of the spectrum. So I think we'll get a good, uh, a good view uh, on the uh, total value chain. And I think you know, as Ishank pointed out, there are some key issues uh, that probably are going to come up during this, this discussion as we talk about their particular uh, experiences and opportunities and challenges with, which, with respect to biofortified uh, products. Um, 
The first person that I wanted to introduce, just to confirm that she is here, is Rose Mutuko with us. Are you there, Rose? Yes, I'm with you. Hi. 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 Nice, nice to hear from you. So Rose is the a managing director of Smart Logistics Solutions based in Kenya. Um, she has developed an agribusiness model that offers over 5,000 smallholder women farmers a structured route to market and a commercially viable opportunities, um, particularly with uh, nutritious foods that are made with uh, iron beans that target low income populations. Um, it started in 2009 and their mission being innovating nutritious foods to improve the quality of life. Um, now, I wondered, first of all, Rose, if you could just tell us a little bit more specifically about what your, what your iron bean related business is. Um, and uh, I'm particularly interested, I think our, our audience would be interested in particularly working with thousands of smallholder farmers. What are the dynamics there um, since that's your, your supply chain? Um, how do you manage that? And, and how do we make that work in, in biofortification? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Peter, and uh, hi everyone. So as you heard, my name is Rose Motuko, and uh, I've been in this business uh, for the last 10, over 10 years, let, let me say that. So as a company, we are producing high iron uh, beans uh, into four main products. We have a, a product known as Beansy, which is a 15 minutes cook bean that we process. We have a product known as Fragiles, is a 100% pre-cooked bean flours. We also are adding beans into instant noodles, uh, and we have been enhanced in instant noodles by the name of uh, Super Noodle. And also we have a bean snack, which is a very nutritious, ready to eat uh, snack uh, by the name of Keroma. So those are the products that we are uh, we are promoting and uh, putting up in the market. And also we want to th gain, uh, thank Gain very much for helping us and supporting us a lot on the product development and also uh, in, in consumer research and many other technical and uh, financial support. So th thank you Gain. So uh, you've asked me about uh, the smallholder farmers. Yes, we've been working with the smallholder farmers. Initially, before we started processing, we were aggregators and we were working with smallholder farmers to aggregate uh, different products and crops to supply to other processors. And then by 2015, 2015, we started now, we put up our own processing plant. So working with smallholder farmers has been part of our business from, the, from day one. So we understand how to work with them and to produce the crops uh, that we need uh, to produce. Uh, but yes, there are many, many dynamics, especially on the micronutrient rich uh, products. Uh, one, uh, as uh, some co consumers and uh, also participants are asking, many people think biofortification is equal to GMO. And uh, they, they always also fear to start planting GMOs. There are all sorts of stories around uh, uh, the products. So there's a lot of awareness that needs to be done down there. And also, there's also very uh, limited availability of seed of the same crops. And of course, the other biggest challenge that we have is differentiation. Uh, you know, the biofortified crops look exactly like the non-biofortified uh, uh, crops. So we really are not uh, a lot of intervention, especially from the government institutions and policy uh, makers uh, so that uh, the farmers can and other stakeholders can start understanding what is a biofortified uh, crop? Because people don't understand what is biofortification. And uh, it becomes like a, you know, like a marketing gimmick uh, that the private companies are trying to use to entice consumers on their products. So we need a lot of, um, or a lot of um, awareness in there and a lot of education to most of the consumers, both the consumers and the producers. Farmers are very also uh, open to, 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 to biofortification crops and they're very excited, especially the beans, because the beans are very, you know, tech, they're drought resistant. They take a short time to grow. So those are key things that are enticing the farmers and attracting them. 
And then when you top it off by explaining the nutritional aspect of that, then they become very excited to grow that. Of course, as we see that coming up, we are also seeing a lot of, uh, you know, we, we are afraid that uh, we are seeing a lot of other, 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 other stakeholders who take advantage of the differentiation factor and mm. supply non-biofortified seed and call it fortified seed. So mm. I think that is also a matter of policy intervention, which we can't do at this stage as a, as, as a company. But uh, of course, we really need uh, that intervention to happen and the farmers to start understanding exactly what they are planting. Of course, we need an integrity in, the, in terms of the seed system so that the farmers can start actually buying the correct seed and also sell the correct uh, product. So we have a, a, a system, a model that we call the COPMAS model, which we've been working with uh, to ensure that uh, actually uh, we are successful in engaging the farmers and also successful in able to, to, to be able to, be, to sell our product to the farmers. Because in the model also, the farmers are marketing some of the products, especially the bean flowers among themselves and they are making food. And of course, we are very excited to say that, uh, you know, the smallholder farmers who cannot afford, uh, let's say meat, they can't afford uh, other, other stews and soups are using the beans very usefully because most of the time they sell everything they have and then they remain with nothing. So mm -hmm. with the product development that, we, that and the support that we are getting from various stakeholders, we are able to put up uh, very good uh, products out there and we believe that uh, biofortification is the way to go. The only Excellent. thing also we need to be supported to be able to understand and also to bring so many other people on board to, to understand what is biofortification and what is the impact. Thank you. Excellent, excellent. It sounds like we need some seed, seed police to, uh, <laughs> to, to make sure we have the, the right kind of the biofortified and certified and authenticated. Um, that's that's very interesting. And actually, I'm going to pass over to Arabisala Palumi, CEO of Cato Foods from Nigeria. I'm sure, uh, I just want to make sure, Arabisala, are you on the line? Yes, I am. Good Great. afternoon. Great. Yeah, can yeah. hear you and see you very well. Um, Thank you, I'm Peter. sure a lot. I'm sure a lot of what Rose said probably resonates with you as well, seeing as you uh, make uh, uh, food products based on uh, biofortified ingredients, particularly vitamin A cassava. I actually had the chance to, to try your uh, vitamin A cassava product while I was in Nigeria a couple of years ago. It was very tasty. Um, and uh, just so everybody knows that uh, Cato Foods is a, is a pioneer in, in you know, SMA biofortified food processing in Nigeria. And uh, Palumi has worked on product development. We've worked with him at uh, Harvest Plus. I think he's working with CBC as well now. Um, and the vitamin A cassava products, uh, you know, obviously vitamin A cassava is being grown by, you know, nearly 200, 2 million uh, smallholder farming families in Nigeria, and you're definitely leveraging that. Um, my first question for you, Palumi, is when I met you a couple of years ago, you outlined expansion plans for your biofortified food product output. Um, I'm curious to know how, how that's progressed you know, obviously there was COVID in the meantime and currently may have affected it. And what's, you know, what is driving growth and demand and how are you, are you able to meet that demand? All right, thank you, um, Pisa. Good afternoon, everyone from Nigeria here. And um, it's good to be here. Um, well, one thing we have seen about um, biofortified um, food in Nigeria is that there has been um, a lot of increased demand. And um, a lot of what uh, Rose said actually resonates um, with me. And um, I can, I was just saying like, oh, this is a replica of um, what is happening in Nigeria too. And you know, um, a couple of years ago when we met, we discussed about um, expansion plans. At that time that we met, we were um, still operating at a smaller factory then. Uh, where we were processing about, um, which has a capacity of about one ton per day. And um, between that time and now, I think that was um, 2019, uh, between that time and now, despite the COVID, we have been able to move to um, a bigger factory that has the capacity to process about 35 to 40 tons of um, vitamin A cassava per day. 
um, despite the COVID. Um, however, when the COVID came, it, it was a lot of challenge for us. It was um, a serious challenge for us as um, we were hoping to consolidate on the gains that we made in 2019 to be able to expand further into new markets in 2020. Um, however, because of the COVID, we had to just try as much as possible to maintain the, the market that we had um, already so that they are not lost due to the disruptions in the supply, in the supply chain. And um, one of the things that we have seen that is driving the demand in, in Nigeria for biofortified um, food is the fact that number one, there is um, from the farmer side, there is um, the business opportunity for the farmers. Bio fortified crops have been able to offer the farmers additional um, source of, of revenue, especially because the bio fortified crops, when you talk about cassava and, and the bio fortified maize, and even the OFSP, the orange fresh potato, are drought resistant. And um, these bio fortified crops are also high yielding. So it's able to, with good agronomic practices, it's able to give the farmer um, a higher yield and in turn, a higher income or revenue. So that is one of the things that is driving it um, from the farmer side. However, it's, there are a lot of challenges um, on that side too. Um, in terms of the um, consumer end, um, one of the things that is driving the demand from the consumer end is that biofortified foods, um, I, I beat tastier than the conventional food, especially when they are processed very well. Um, they, they offer very good quality in terms of taste. Um, they offer the additional nutrition, which um, everybody is running after because now people are beginning to um, become more aware that you are what you eat, you, you are a sum total of what you eat and that food is not food if it is not nutritious. So people want to eat healthy, they want to live better, they want to be able to, to fulfill their potentials, and especially they want to ensure that their children, um, farming household, especially mothers want to ensure that um, should their children have access um, to this uh, food. And so one of the things that Cattle Foods is doing as a pioneer a food processor, a bio fortified food processor in Nigeria, is to support farming households, to support small older farmers, to create a lot of awareness um, at the base of the pyramid so that more people are aware of this uh, biofortified um, food. And as a result of that, that is driving some, some demand. If we take the case of Oshun State um, in Southwest Nigeria, where cattle food is located for, for an example, you realize that the demand for biofortified um, crop varieties to plant this planting season has increased by more than 300%. In fact, as a matter of fact, farmers don't have enough um, planting materials to, to cultivate at the moment. And um, even those of us that are processing don't even have enough um, raw materials to process because of the, the increased demand. So um, that, that's impressive. It, that sounds like a yeah. bottleneck that we so, need to work on through CBC. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So a lot of pull and push effect, even though the strategy has been as focused more on, on push from the farmer's side, but then there is need for us to focus more on the a, a kind of pull effect to make um, this bio fortified um, food business more market driven so that if the market demands for more, once the farmers see that there is a place they can sell their pro farm produce to, they tend to go back to their farms and cultivate more. About fortified food um, adoption in Nigeria and the scaling demand um, has come with its own challenges, especially challenges with um, access to varieties of the bio fortified crops that have higher dry matter content, uh, which I believe, which um, I am aware Aves Plus is working on at the moment to ensure that farmers have access to varieties that have dry, higher dry matter content. And also the challenges in the area of um, registration, product registration. Yes, we do a lot of product formulation, product development, but then we face a lot of challenges in getting this product um, um, registered on time. So these are some of the things that we are, uh, facing there, but in the whole, there's a whole lot of opportunities that we have um, in the biofortified food um, sector in Nigeria. 
using cattle food as, a, as an example, where we have been able to move from a one-ton factory to a factory that is um, having um, the capacity to process about 35 to 40 tons of, of vitamin A cassava within a space of four years. Wow. So we're definitely seeing some themes, some common themes here developing in terms of, uh, you know, definitely a lot of opportunity, still some bottlenecks or challenges that we need to address. And obviously that's the focus of what the CBC is trying to do to accelerate things. I want to bring in uh, Fortunata Mamari. Uh, are you on the line, Fortunata? Yes, sure. Hi, another, uh, another Hi. Food, food sector uh, entrepreneur, co-founder and managing director of AFCO Investment in Tanzania. Uh, they're producing, among other things, flour uh, using a vitamin A maize and uh, or, you know, vitamin A orange sweet potato. Um, company was recognized by Tanzania's prime minister's office as an SME champion in promoting access to nutritious food in Tanzania. Um, Fortunata, based on what you're hearing from, from your colleagues in other countries, do you, do you see similar opportunities and challenges in Tanzania with respect to uh, biofortification? And um, I noticed, just to add to that, uh, Tanzania also uh, recently issued comprehensive guidelines on biofortification. Uh, you know, I wonder if you could maybe talk about the enabling environment and whether or not what the government is doing is, is helping uh, grow the market. Yeah, uh, sure. Thank you, Peter, uh, for having this opportunity to discuss on this uh, on bar fortification. And maybe I can start. We are processing uh, four products with ingredient of bar fortified crops. Um, these are provitamin A maize and orange flesh sweet potato. We have one product which is hundred percent with provitamin A maize. This is a special product for the family. Uh, step of food, but the other three one, these are composite flour with the ingredient of uh, provitamin A maize and the other one with orange flesh sweet potato. And all this one we will we are channeling uh, through retail shop, like 95% of our product, uh, the model we are using selling is through the retail shop. And this uh, supermarket, but also informal, informal uh, uh, retail shops like small dukas, like uh, uh, street vendor tables. And the other 5%, uh, this is a new mode of sales uh, uh, we are using in, in channeling, our, channeling our product to the market. Uh, we, we have just introduced this year and we come out with this new model because of the, of the impact of COVID-19. Uh, uh, and this is the door-to-door -door, uh, sales which we are using the sales agent to deliver our product to the door ports, to the consumers. Uh, but also we have scan around uh, our, our, our factory. We have noticed we have the, a lot of kindergarten schools. So now we are supplying also to the kindergarten school of composite flour. So these are the model that we are using. And for this new model, we think this is a good model, which we think we can invest on it and, 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 and scaling the model because we have seen through door-to-door -door, uh, uh, sales, we got an opportunity to meet with the consumers, to listen from them, to listen their challenge, but we got an opportunity to preach the good news of our product. Uh, about the enabling environment in Tanzania, uh, I can say sure, for now we have the good environment, because the government is in promoting the consumption of biofortified crops. Uh, we have the strong strategy for promoting um, school feeding program. Uh, so I can say that the government, they are aware. And once the government is aware and keep layer uh, on biofortification, that means it's easy for other consumers, uh, individual consumers to, to get the good news about the biofortification because they are speaking on media, they're speaking on their congregation and the meeting. So it's easy for the, for the news of biofortified crops to spread to the, to the consumers. And we've, we have seen even we uh, as a processor, uh, we got an opportunity to pilot uh, Provitamin A maize on 2017. We worked with uh, building nutrition food basket to pilot Provitamin A maize. 
Uh, it was challenged at the moment when we introduced the, 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 the flower in the market uh, in terms of acceptability. Uh, consumer were asking why this is, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a yellow maize. They used to the white maize. Why this is a, is a, is a orange sweet potato. They used to the uh, white sweet potatoes. But we have seen since the government is in, the information of the color, the information of addressing the, the, the challenge and the question which the consumer they have is going very fast because the key player is the government. The government is preaching this good news. So they are doing the very good work in terms of raising awareness. But also as the government uh, enabling environment for the small enterprise, as other they, they have mentioned uh, before that SME, they're doing very well job to, to, I mean, to deliver the nutritious food to the market. For Tanzania, I can say, now they are providing a, a room for the small enterprise uh, uh, through their, their government agents, like registering the, their food. Uh, there is a different basket for large uh, a processor and a small processor. So the small processor, they have their own requirements, which in a way is like they are, they, are, they are not equal to the larger processor. So for that chance, for that opportunity, it's easy to bring in more processor to process the food because at least the requirement are not the same like the, the, the requirement for the large processor. So there are, there are a little waiver for small enterprises. So when you talk about the enabling environment, I think we are doing very well. However, with GAIN, with Sun Business Network, we got an opportunity to sit together with this uh, key player like government and the other agencies. Uh, we got an opportunity to share the challenge we experienced now and then in the market. And we have seen through sharing the challenge, through sharing out our challenge as a processor in the market with, uh, I mean, the, the, the regulation and the requirement, we have seen the changes they are accepting, they are implementing our, our, our feedback. So for the enabling environment, I think for Tanzania, they're doing very well. Excellent. And I think you bring up a good point, which is at the end of the day, uh, food SMEs, seed SMEs, at the end of the day, they're SMEs. And like all SMEs, there needs to be an environment that's conducive to the kind of work that they're doing and not just obviously geared toward larger larger organizations, larger businesses. So I think you make a very good point there. Um, I'm going to switch gears now in the, in the interest of time, and we're going to switch from the food side to the seed side of the equation. Uh, we're very honored to have with us Dr. Javed Ahmed, who is the director of the Wheat Research Institute in Faisalabad, Pakistan. I'd like to refer to him as Mr. Zinc Wheat because he is a uh, the man who really drove uh, the development of uh, some of the zinc wheat varieties, particularly the most recent one, Akbar 19, which is a, a fantastic variety that's, that's really um, taking on well. Um, I think the wheat seed production has really, zinc wheat seed production has really increased significantly in the past year or two. Um, and uh, I just wanted to ask Dr. Ahmad, um, what he sees from his perspective, from the seed perspective, is the most effective ways um, to really catalyze interest among farmers. And what, what, what role do, do SME uh, level businesses play in this, in this regard? Over to you, Dr. Akhna. Thank you, Peter, and um, very good evening from Pakistan to everyone. Uh, let me show you uh, some screens. Uh, you're interested. Uh, as my earlier fellows uh, very rightly mentioned that uh, uh, it is the nutrition enhancement is on uh, UN's agenda and uh, global, globally accepted fact. Similarly, Pakistan is also uh, putting emphasis on uh, adopt, um, production and adoption of the nutrition, nutritious uh, crops. And it is included in Pakistan's multi-sectoral nutritional strategy. Uh, and also it's on the provincial uh, priorities. And we have a big project on nutrition enhancement in crops, fruits, vegetables, and their products. Uh, you know, for developing countries, it's really 
uh, difficult to adopt the food diversification, supplementation, and fortification by artificial means. The best choice is fortification of uh, staple foods. What we are doing uh, in Pakistan, uh, the, we are uh, developing and disseminating the biofortified crops. And uh, with the Punjab government, uh, we are working uh, for nutrition enhancement in different crops and for wheat. Our emphasis is uh, uh, zinc, iron, and vitamin A enhancement. And uh, uh, with the, the working of my institute, along with Harvest Plus and uh, Punjab Agriculture Research Board collaboration, uh, we have developed two wheat varieties, the zinc coal 2016 by our uh, central wheat program, the national program, and the Akbar 19 uh, by our provincial program. And for uh, the through the Punjab government program, we are developing varieties of rice, corn, pulses, fruits, and vegetables uh, having a better nutrition quality. But today I will confine my talk to the wheat only. Uh, for wheat, uh, we are uh, working uh, with close collaboration or with Harvest Plus uh, for identification of zinc gem plasm and then uh, it's accelerated breeding to develop new varieties and it's uh, um, evaluation um, of uh, newly developed uh, zinc from zinc line in different ecological zone for uh, development of uh, um, stable varieties uh, having high zinc. So uh, as I have already mentioned, the Akbar and uh, zinc coal are our success story, but uh, uh, we have very good germplasm in pipeline too. Uh, there are two advanced lines uh, uh, which are in uh, uh, which are from our national program and two lines from uh, uh, my institute and the other two from our regional program of South Punjab and one uh, advanced line 1705. It's in. Uh, final stages of approval and by the next uh, year, it will also be available to farmers. You can say the advanced line the, uh, from Wheat Research Institute, Taslabad, they have even more high zinc than the Akbar 19. So coming towards the adoption of biofortified wheat seeds, uh, the key driver in adoption uh, by the farmer is uh, high yield potential because the farmer are mostly interested in the tonnage because uh, uh, in present setup, they are uh, not getting uh, additive advantages of uh, a high nutrition. So the responsibility lies uh, mostly upon the breeders to develop varieties which will have the high yield and disease resistance and the nu high nutrition will be an additive added value. So. Uh, the Akbar 19 is our success story. It, presently, it is the most high yielding variety in Pakistan. Uh, so um, it's becoming popular among the farmers and seed producers day by day. The constraints, uh, the sorry, uh, the main constraints or bottlenecks in low adaption uh, um, are the large scale awareness because people, uh, uh, should become aware about the yield potential and the uh, additive advantage of uh, high nutrient value of these uh, newly developed varieties. And then the availability of uh, seed at mass scale to the farmers. And uh, as I have already mentioned that there is no premium for high zinc wheat. The main players in adoption are uh, for seed production or, or development of varieties and early generation seed production are the public sector mainly, uh, but for the um, uh, certified seed production and then the uh, farming and the mostly the small and medium enterprises, including seed producers, farmers, aggregators, and processors, they play their role. Uh, for, public, uh, for public sector, uh, this year, uh, uh, in the annual wheat production plan we, um, of the Agriculture Extension and Adaptive Research Punjab, we have added uh, um, Akbar and zinc coal as the high zinc varieties. Similarly, 
in annual seed production plan uh, made by Punjab Seed Corporation. Uh, they have uh, um, added it in as main varieties for their seed multiplication. And similarly, uh, for early generation seed production, uh, we have uh, we are focusing uh, uh, at Wheat Research Institute, Faisalabad, Rari Bahawalpur, and NARC Islamabad for early generation seed multiplication at um, larger scale. Similarly, Harvest Plus and Gain, uh, they are providing us assistance in awareness and promotion campaigns. Uh, Excellent. The, yeah, the uh, major role uh, of SMEs is in seed production because uh, 80% of the certified seed is being produced by uh, private seed companies. And then the role of milling and processing industries and farmers and aggregators uh, that comes and uh, harv we are working with Harvest Plus and gain for uh, to sensitize these SMEs. Uh, for, for farmers, uh, we are uh, organizing farmer gatherings and also give some free seed distribution of housing varieties and then plant the demonstration plots for farmer awareness. The, in public sector, the research institutes, uh, as I mentioned, that they produce the early generation seed. And uh, previously, our capacity was less for early generation seed production. And now, Government has established, government of the Punjab has established a, a found, foundation seed cell at Ayub Agriculture Research Institute, Faisalabad, um, with their development funding. And this cell will explore the public sector lands and also coordinate with the private sector for uh, early generation seed production under direct supervision of the breeders. Similarly, Punjab Seed Corporation, they have also. Um, enhance their capacity uh, through a development project. And hopefully by the next year, the availability of early generation seed will be two to three times more than the present. And this is a big step from public sector. Similarly, private seeds companies, they have, as I have already mentioned, they have 80% share in certified seed companies and 43 seed companies uh, are in touch with us for uh, multiplication of Akbar 19 and Zing code. And regarding, regarding the uh, role of private seed companies, I actually, it, just in the interest of time, I wanted to see if we could get our last panelist uh, to jump in on that. Um, is Mr. Uh, Hakbai on the, on the line? Is that cool? Is that cool? Are you there? From Supreme Seed Company in Bangladesh? No, he's not. Oh, he didn't make it on. Okay. Uh, yeah, I was hoping he could comment on, on his perspective from Bangladesh, but unfortunately he didn't seem to be able to get on the line. I'm sorry, Mr. Ahmed, go ahead. Um, I think, uh, you know, I think what you're saying is very interesting in terms of the, the role of SME seed companies, basically as the, you know, as the multipliers. Um, are they seeing any particular uh, constraints or, you know, things that, for example, the CBC program would be able to assist in terms of, um, you know, helping them to facilitate increase in output or uh, generating more interest among among farmers in terms of uh, providing that that multiplied seed. Uh, yeah, the major problem was uh, the uh, availability of early generation seed. As uh, so, the uh, private seed companies they were. Uh, uh, just relying upon um, a production of uh, a certified to certified seed. Uh, mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. yeah, and the federal seed certification and registration department, uh, uh, they check the quality and uh, uh, provide them the uh, category of approved seed. But by now, by the uh, this uh, capacity uh, enhancement of public sector, uh, we shall be uh, able to cater their needs and uh, uh, secondly, the actual uh, problem is uh, completing the chain of uh, from uh, the 
seed producers or seed availability to farmers uh, from private sector and then uh, from purchasing from uh, farmer uh, you see it's aggregation or aggreg um, aggregation of the um, uh, zinc fortified seed and provision it to the uh, uh, this uh, value addition and uh, industry like the um, flour mills or small chuckies or uh, food processors uh, so that uh, we can make a complete model where the pro high zinc product will reach uh, to the uh, ultimate consumers with the tag of uh, high nutritious uh, product. So in this, the gain or harvest plus can assist us. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. Uh, and thank to all the panels. This has been just a fascinating discussion about the ins and outs and the nuts and bolts of, of uh, promoting biofortified products. Uh, we just have about 10 minutes left and we wanted to provide a little bit of time to respond to some of the many questions that we're receiving from the audience. Uh, uh, and, and I should tell the audience members that um, we obviously will not get to all of them now, but we will uh, go through the questions and respond to you uh, offline. Um, uh, to the extent possible. Um, there was one, there's been some common questions and they kind of relate to some of the things that uh, some of our food sector SME partners were talking about. And maybe Ishank and Rav or Ravinder might want to address this question about how are we addressing um, the labeling and identification issue in terms of biofortified uh, products? What, what sort of uh, initiatives might be available to, to address that? Uh, to address that issue. Uh, Ishank or Ravinder, are you able to respond? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> Peter, I'll go first and then Ishank can add probably to it. So there are two approaches primarily that the program is trying to work on. One, there is, a, you know, like Ishank mentioned, standards is an important piece that has been identified. Most of the countries have guidance for what should be the zinc or iron levels at variety level. and. Uh, also, they have food regulations which take care of the processed products. But grains is one element for which the standards do not exist in uh, many countries. So that's an important piece that we are addressing. We are working on uh, uh, global standards for zinc, and we will also be moving on to iron and uh, vitamin A standards. So that should be providing a guideline in terms of what are the minimum threshold levels of these micronutrients those should be available. Other important related question, Peter, which I saw in the chat box, I would like to answer is on uh, sure. the testing infrastructure. Yeah, this is a very good question and that's a very important part. Uh, right now, uh, the testing for this is happening at centralized laboratories, either at CG centers or uh, uh, you know the common programs where we have these centralized laboratories available. But there are also efforts those are going on in taking these uh, test, this, this testing infrastructure to the field level because as we scale up, it will be more and more important that the testing should be real time and the result turnover should be faster. So uh, there are interesting things those are being worked uh, in terms of uh, XRF based, uh, uh, you know, testing guns, which can give reports on uh, the micronutrient levels in nearly real time. And uh, so that's definitely a, a, a important area which is being focused on. By it. Thank you. Ishank, did you want to add something? No, I think uh, Ravinder has addressed it quite adequately. Uh, probably we can take more questions. Okay, very good. Um, there's another question that's, I think, addressed to all of our panelists that are in the in the food sector. I think you, you all touched on it a little bit, but maybe we could elaborate a little bit. Um, you know, given that for the most part, consumers don't really buy a lot of food products on the basis of the nutritional value, um, you know, what are the key drivers or incentives that, that you are using to, to grow consumer demand for your products? Um, I'll ask, uh, I'll ask um, um, uh, Rose to, to respond to that first. Rose, are you still on the line? Yeah, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, uh, as you know that consumers really, most of the consumers I don't understand and don't look at nutrition. But uh, then you will sell uh, by highlighting the, you know, the, the affordability of the, of the product, the quality of the product, the taste of the product. 
and that is maybe the delicious part of it. But as much as I say that today, the, 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 the consumer today is much aware of, of nutrition, especially so with the, with the health concept that has, are coming on board and also with the COVID-19 is actually bringing consumers to start thinking more about uh, the nutritional aspect of products. Uh, nonetheless, we have to look at more uh, maybe creative ways of, of being able to sell nutrition uh, to the consumers because most of them do not really go and look at the nutrition aspect of the, of the product. Thank you. Thank you. Um, sorry. Um, Fortunata, would you like to, to add anything to that? Yes, uh, sure. Maybe I can add what Rosa said. Mm -hmm. uh, for Tanzania, for my side, uh, what consumer consider is also is, is only price and convenient. Convenient in terms of how easily they can the, the, the product can reach them. So how we address it uh, for Afco, we have tried our level base to to sell in affordable price. But what we have done, we have tried to have the different size of the product. Previously, we had only one kilogram and above, but now we have come to 500 um, grams. That is half of kilograms, mm -hmm. uh, which we think is affordable to the low-income consumers. And, and, and through the model we are using of door-to-door -door sales, we, 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 have, we have learned we need even to go to 100 um, grams, even 200 grams for, for, for a consumer to be able to purchase even a, a flour to, to cook for a day, not to store because of the level of their income. And, mm -hmm. and for the issue of convenient, um, we, we, it's what we are doing now. We are going to increase the base of our, of our cell agent so as they can reach them with uh, nutrition knowledge and once we have learned, once a, a sales agent, I mean, acquire or capture the, I mean, the, their customer, it will, it will not be easy for the customer to move because they have the close uh, relationship with them. So it's to strengthen the relationship with the customer, but also the price and the price, not only affordable, but also the size and the awareness. That's how we are addressing the issue of consumer. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, we have another another couple of questions. I think we'll try to get in here before we summarize. Um, one is a very specific question also, maybe for the food sector SME folks, about uh, controlling vitamin A loss in cassava and orange flesh sweet potato during the, the processing phase. Um, do you have any any comments on how to how to manage that or whether that's an issue that you are uh, that you are grappling with on the production side. Um, maybe, may, actually, maybe Fortunata, you might want to comment on that as well, since you are you are uh, um, processing those those kind of crops. Maybe Palumi, you might want to weigh in as well. I see you up there, Palumi. Why don't you go ahead? Oh, all right. Th thank you very much. Um, well, when it comes to um, controlling vitamin A loss in processing these above fortified. Um, crops. Um, there are there are processing standards. There are good processing or good manufacturing practices that needs to be adhered to, and that is one of the things that uh, Cattle Food has benefited from um, Aves Plus in in past years, um, receiving technical support in the area of processing, and also we as Cattle Foods because we are also giving to research and development in our processing te techniques. So we have also been able to also evolve and come up with um, ways to manage vitamin A loss in um, these crops, especially the cassava. And one thing to note is that when your biofortified crops is in, is in the wet form, when it still has the, the moisture, um, there, is, there is little loss of this um, vitamin A. The loss comes in when you have processed it into the final um, dried products. And that is where storage practices and uh, packaging materials um, come to play. So there is, it is important that um, food SMEs, especially biofortified food SMEs and processors make use of um, the right packaging materials to ensure that um, the biofortified food can stay 
uh, longer on the show. And maybe just to add to the issue of um, having ways of encouraging the consumers to purchase um, biofortified food, especially because most of them don't think of, there is this belief that most of them don't think about um, nutrition. The truth is people are becoming more aware that they are what they eat, that you're exactly what you eat. And in Nigeria, for instance, in Southwest Nigeria, where I come from, there is this old saying that um, good food is the friend of the body. And so mm -hmm. that is popular in Nigeria, that good food is the friend of the body. So even while you know that you are trying as much as possible to just get food, you also want to get food that will make you um, live better. And which is one of the things we do here in Nigeria at Kato Foods to ensure that nutritious food is affordable, it is available, it is accessible, and it is safe for consumers, especially the vulnerables that we are targeting with this um, uh, biofortified food. So for the controlling of the loss, use the right um, processing techniques, use the right um, packaging materials, and cattle food is available to give you, give um, uh, food SMEs, both those who are there already, or those who are looking forward to um, coming into the bio fortified food processing. Cattle food is available with support from Aves Plus and Gain to be able to give you these um, trainings on how to process the biofortified food to uh, ensure that they uh, maintain their vitamin A level. Thank you. Thank you very much, Arbo Sala. And thank you to all the panelists. I think we're, we're almost out of time. I think I'm gonna need to pass it over to Jillian to provide a little summary. Um, but I just wanna thank everyone for a fantastic discussion, very informative. Uh, once again, I want to mention that there, the many questions we receive, we will follow up offline. So please don't despair. Uh, we will respond to your question. Um, and with that, I will pass it over to Jillian. Thank you. Thank you so much, Peter. And thank you, everyone who has managed to log in and stay with us until this time. I will be brief. Uh, we've, we've had great, great discussions, uh, questions flowing in, and which were very useful and can really help in shaping our program and also encourage us in working with SMEs better. We see that uh, biofortification is a unique opportunity to get uh, support from a multi-sectoral approach. It is a great start for partnerships between SMEs and development world as well as the government. So this goes beyond uh, nutrition itself. It is a way to address uh, malnutrition. We encourage SMEs to deal in biofortified crops as this leads to growth in income and livelihoods, boosts, boosts nutrition and health, uh, promotes uh, resilience and adaptation to climate change. So for us to succeed, we need demand from consumers, demand from the public sector, um, public standards, and also business development. We, of course, have some challenges that we need to address. And, and the major one will be demand, which looks at awareness and, and pricing of these crops, uh, differentiation issues, uh, the appearance and test of the, the, the biofortified crops and the traceability, as well as uh, managing the, 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 the partnerships, the private and public partnerships. We acknowledge that uh, SMEs play a major role in the global development as they are key drivers of innovation and are better at embracing and identifying nutrients in the market. Uh, the businesses majorly embrace the trends and understand the, the consumers better. Uh, we've seen businesses profiting quite well in, in, in uh, NECs. And the, 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 the key benefits are that there is an existing market and these markets are helping in creating creating jobs. These crops are climate smart crops and best for conservation of our environment, specifically soil. Um, we for, for 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 businesses to realize a benefits, there needs to be monetary benefits, uh, which needs to be clear, spe specifically. Uh, for the farmers, supply and demand linkage, linkages um, should not be uh, should be taken care of, which will lead to encouraging the value chain to grow. Uh, awareness, especially with the farmers, is key 
and uh, they are, they are, as much as there are multiple up avenues in the urban sector that can be used to communicate to the benefits of these foods, there needs to be better channels for and better strategies for farmers who are mostly operating in the in the rural setup. Uh, the good news is farmers in quite a number of countries are open to trading and dealing and growing the NECs. So this is an avenue and a, bet, a best way to addressing hidden hunger and uh, to accessing uh, consumers. Uh, so uh, as we look at other issues that really help in growing this sector is that we see when the government and um, a, a good environment is provided, uh, better strategies come up. There's a better way of promoting this food. So we need an, an enabling environment. We need governments to come in to help in accessing consumers, accessing different programs for us to ensure that there's demand for this for these foods. The program uh, as CBC uh, looks to come in and provide technical support. Uh, build capacity and skills for development. We'll also expose these businesses to marketing and, and, and exposure and also provide financial support. So we are here to facilitate uh, co-learning and collaboration as well as advocacy for a better food system. And this can better be facilitated through a multi-sectoral approach. Uh, moving forward and beyond this webinar, we are really grateful that you made time to join us today. And uh, we are looking to share this information further uh, through an email and, and other better ways of sharing. The recording is on the GAIN YouTube page, which was shared earlier by my colleague, but we are going to send an email uh, beyond um, this webinar. All the, the presentation will also be availed. And we are looking uh, forward to um, getting deeper into policy discussions as we shape up discussions for uh, a policy webinar in the coming, in the coming months and, and before the year. So I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you all again for making time. Thank you for being very participative and um, bringing in questions that we did not think about, but these are, these are questions and discussions that are going to help us shape the program better. Uh, find better ways of engaging with, with, with the SMEs and also build better programs that will promote the NECs. Thank you so much and thank you to Peter for the great uh, moderation. Have a good day. Thank you and bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day, evening, night. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for your time. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, and have a good night. Jillian? Yes, Peter. Are we able to uh, gather the questions so we can respond to them? I guess I can just copy them. Well, we, we will, I will share with you the report with all the questions. Okay. Yeah, so uh, allow me to close the webinar, then I will collect all the reports and share. Very good, thank you. Yeah.